The Common Law by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Lecture One: Early Forms of Liability. The object of this book is to present a general view for the common law. To accomplish the task, other tools are needed besides logic. It sometimes is something to show that it, the consistency of a system requires a particular result, but it is not all. The life of the law. As not being logic, as being experience, the felt necessity for the time, the prevalent moral and political theories, intuitions of public policy, avowed or unconscious, even the prejudices which judges share with the fellow men, have had a good deal more to do with, to do than the syllogism. In determining the rules by which man should be governed, the law embodies the story of a nation's development through many centuries. It cannot be dealt with as if it contains only the axioms and corollaries of the of a book of mathematics. In order to know what it is, we must know what it has been and what it tends to become. We must alternatively consult history and existing theories of legislation. But the most difficult labor will be to understand the combination of the two into new products, new products at every stage. The substance of the law at any given time pretty nearly corresponds so far as it goes with what is then understood to be. Convenient, but it is a form and machinery, and degree to which it is able to work out desired results depend very much upon the past. In Massachusetts today, while on the one hand there was there are a great many rules which are quite sufficiently accounted for by their manifest good sense, on the other, the sum which can only be understood. By reference to the infancy, a procedure among the German tribes, or to the social condition of Rome under the Decemvirs, I shall use the history of our law, so far as it is necessary, to explain conception or to interpret the rule, but no further. In doing so, there are two errors equally to be avoided, both by writer and reader. One is that of supposing, because that idea seems very familiar and natural to us, that it has always been so. Many things which we take for granted have had to be laboriously thought out, or thought out in past times. The other mistake is the opposite one of asking too much of history. We started with man for groom. It may be assumed that the earliest barbarian whose practices are to be considered had a good many of the same feelings and passions as ours. The first subject to be discussed is the general theory of liability, civil and criminal. The common law has changed a good deal since the beginning of our series of reports and the search of the theory which. May now be said to prevail is very much a study for tendencies. I believe that it will be instructed to go back to the early forms of liability to start from them. It's commonly known that the early forms of legal procedure were grounded in vengeance. Modern writers have thought that the Roman law started from the blunt field. All the authority, all authorities agree, agree. That the German law began in that way. The field led to the composition of the first optional, then compulsory, by which the field was bought off. The gradual encroachment of the composition may be traced in the Anglo-Saxon laws, and the field was pretty well broken up, though not extinguished.
by the time of William the Conqueror. The killings and the horse burnings of a early day became the pures of mayhem and the arson, the pures de passe a palages, and the mayhem became, or rather were, the insultants, the action of a transpense which is still familiar to lawyers. But as the composition recovered in the peel was the alternative for vengeance, we might expect to find is a scope limited to the scope of vengeance. Vengeance imports a feeling for blame and opinion, however, distorted by passion that is that the wrong has been done. It can hardly go very far beyond the case of a harm intentionally inflicted. Even dog distinguishes between being stumbled over and being kicked. Whether for this cause or another, the early she appealed for personal violence seemed to have been confined to international wrong, intentional wrongs. Glanville mentions melees, blows, and wounds, all forms of intentional violence. In the following description of such appeals given by Bracton, it is made quite clear that they were based on intentional assaults. The Pio de Passe e Palages laid an intentional assault, described the nature, the arm used, the length and depth of the wound. The pillar also had to show that it, he immediately raised the hue and the cry. So when Bracton speaks of the lesser offenses, which were not sued by Willow for Pio, he instances only intentional wrongs, such as blows with the face flogging, wounding, insults, and so forth. The course of action in the cases of transplants reported in the early year, yearbooks in the Abreatio Blantium Rome is also an intentional wrong. It was only at the later day and after argument that transplants were extended so as to embrace harms which were foreseen, but which were not the intended consequence of the defendant's act. Thence again it extends to unforeseen injuries. It will be seen that this order for development is uh, not quite consistent with our opinion which had been held. It was a characteristic for early law not to penetrate beyond the external visible facts. The Danum corpore, corporea datum it has been thought that an inquiry into the internal condition of the defendant, his uh, culpability or innocence, implies a refinement of a judicial conception equally foreign to Rome, to Rome before the, the lesser Quilia and to England when transplants took its shape. I do not know any very satisfactory evidence that a man was generally held liable either in Rome or England for the accidental consequences even of his own act. But whatever may have been the early law, the foregoing count shows the starting point of the system with which we have to deal, our system for private liability for the consequences of a man's own acts, that is, for his transparencies, started from the notion of a actual intent to the actual personal culpability. The original principle of liability for harm inflicted by another person or thing have been less carefully considered here the tone than those which govern transplants, and I shall therefore devote the rest of this lecture to discussing them. I shall try to show that this liability also had its root in the passion of revenge, and to point out the changes by which it reached its present form. But I shall not confine myself strictly to what is needful for that purpose, because it is not only most interesting to trace the transformation throughout its whole context, but the story will also afford an instructive example of the mode in which the law has given, has grown without a break from barbarism to civilization.
Furthermore, it will throw much light upon some important and peculiar doctrines which cannot be returned to later. A very common phenomenon, and very familiar to the students of history, is this: the custom, beliefs, and needs of a primitive time establish a rule for a formula. In the course of centuries, the custom, belief, or necessity disappears, but the rule remains. The reason which gave rise to the rule has been forgotten. The ingenious minds set themselves to inquire how it is to be accounted for. Some ground of policy is thought of, which seems to explain it, and to reconcile it with the present state of things. And then the rules adapt itself to the new reasons which have been founded for it, and enters on a new career. The old form receives a new content, and in time even the form. Modified itself to fit the meaning which it had received. The subject under consideration illustrates this course of events very clearly. I will begin by taking a melody, a medley of example, embodying as many distinct roles, which each, with its plausible and seemingly sufficient ground, a policy to explain it. Man has animal. Of no ferocious habits, which escapes and does his neighbor damage, we can prove that the animal escapes through no negligence of his, but still he is held liable. Why? It is said, an athletic jurist, because although he was not negligent at the moment of escape, he was a good for remote heedlessness, or negligence, or fault. In having such a creature at all, or one by whose fall damage is done or to pay for it, a baker's man will、uh, drive his master car to deliver hot rolls for a morning. Once done, the man done, the master has to pay for it. And when he has asked why he should have to pay for the wrongful acts of an independent and responsible being, has been answered from the time for. European、uh, to that of Austin, that is because he was to blame for employing an improper person. If he answered that he used the greatest possible care in choosing his driver, he is told that that is no excuse. As then, by virtue of the reason, is shifted, and he says that there ought to be a remedy against some someone who can pay the damages. And that such wrongful acts, as by ordinary human laws, are like to happen in the course of the service, are imputable to the service. Next, take a case where a limit has been set to liability, which had previously been unlimited. In 1851, Congress passed a law which is still in force, and by which. The owners of shipping and in all in all the more common cases of maritime loss, get stranded the vessel and her freight, then paid into the losers. It is provided that thereupon for the proceedings against the owners shall cease. The legislators to whom we own this act argued that if、uh, a merchant embark a portion of his property upon a hazardous venture. It's reasonable that his stake shall be confined to what he puts at risk, a principle similar to that on which corporation have been so largely created in America during the last fifteen years. Fifty years has been a rule of full criminal pleading in England, down into the present century, that an indictment for homicide must set forth the value of the instrument causing the death. In order that the king or his grantee might claim forfeiture of the dividend as a cursed thing, in the language of Blackstone, I might go on multiplying examples, but these are enough to show remoteness of the points to be brought together. As the first step towards A、generalization、It、will be necessary to consider what is to be found in ancient 
like independent system of law. There is a well-known passage in Exodus, which we shall have to remember later. If an ox gore a man or a woman, then they die. Then the ox shall be surely stoned, and the flesh shall not be eaten, and the owner of the ox shall be quick. When we turn from the Jews to the Greeks, we find the principle of the passage just quoted erected into a system. Plotarch in his Solon tells us that a dog, that a beating a man was to be delivered upon bound to a log for Quiglam. Plato made elaborate provisions in his laws for many such cases. If a a slave killed a man, he was to be given up to the relative of the deceased. If wounded a man, he was to be given up to the injured party to use him as he pleased. So if he did damage to which the injured party did not contribute as a, a joint cause, in either case, if the owner failed to surrender the slave, he was bound to make good the loss. If a beast killed a man, it was to be slain and cast beyond the borders. If an inanimate thing caused death, it was to be cast beyond the borders in like manner, and expiration was to be made. Nor was all this an ideal creation of a merely imagined law, for it was said in one of the speeches of Achenes that uh, Achenes that we banish beyond our borders, stars, the stone, and the steel, voiceless minded things if they chance to kill a man. If a man committed suicide, bury the hand that struck the blow afar from his body. This is mentioned quite as everyday matter, evidently, evidently, without thinking at all, extraordinary, only to point antithesis to the honors heaped upon the mouthfulness. As later as the second century after Christ, the traveler Posanias observed with some surprise that it is still sad in judgment on inanimate things in the Prantanium. Plotarch attributes the institution to Draco. In the Roman law, we find the similar principle of the Noxium, Daddy Teal, gradually leading to further results. The Tau Tables, 451 BC, provided that if an animal had done damage, either the animal to be surrendered to all the damage paid for. We learned from Gaines that the same rule, the same rule, was applied to the torts of children or slave or slaves, and there's some trisophage with regard to inanimate things. The Roman lawyer is not looking beyond the own system or the own time, draw on their wits for explanation which would show that the law as they found it was reasonable. Gaius said that it was unjust that the fault of children or slaves should be a source of loss to the parents or owners beyond their own bodies, and uh, your pin reasons that uh, uh, for, for theory, this was true of things devoid of life, and therefore incapable of guilt, uh, of a fault. This way of uh, approaching the question seemed to deal with the right of a surrender as if it was a limitation of liability incurred by an apparent owner, which would naturally and in the first instance be unlimited. But if that is what was met, it puts the cart before the horse. The right of surrender was not introduced as a limitation liability. We roam the grace like payment was introduced as alternative for failure to surrender. The action was not based as it would be nowadays on the fault of the parent or owner. If it had been, it would always have been brought against the person who had control of the slave or animal at the time he did the harm complained of, and who, if anyone, was to blame for not preventing the injury. So far from this being the cause, 
The person to be sued was the owner at the time of suing. The action followed the guilty thing into whatsoever hands it came, and in curious contrast with the principle as in order to meet still more modern views of public policy, if the animal was of wild nature, that is, in the worst case of the most ferocious animals, the owner ceased to be liable the moment he escaped, because at that moment he ceased to be owner. There seemed to have been no other. Or more extensive liability by the old law, even where a slave was guilty for a guilty with his master's knowledge, unless Pambers was a mere tool in his master's hands. Gaines and the European showed the inclination to count the noxium deditium down to a, a privilege of the owner, in case of misdeeds committed without. His knowledge, but、uh, European is obliged to admit that by the ancient law, according to Celsus, the action was not so, where a slave was guilty even with the privity of his master. All this shows very clearly that the liability of the owner was merely a will of forgetting and the slave or animal which. Was the immediate cause of offence. In other words, vengeance on the immediate offender was the object of the Greek and the early Roman process, not indemnity from the master or owner. The liability of the owner was simply a liability of the offending thing. The primitive custom of grace was enforced by a judicial process expressively. You had against the objects, animate or inanimate. The Roman twelve tables made the owner instead of the thing itself the defendant, but did not in any way change the ground for liability or affect its limit. The change was simply a device to follow to allow the owner to protect his interest. But it may be asked how inanimate object came to be pursued in this way, if the objects. The procedure was to gratify the passion of revenge. Learned men have been ready to find reason in the pers personification of animal nature, common to savages and children, and there is much to confirm this view. Without the such a personification, anger towards lively things would have been transitory and most noticeable. That the commonest example in the most primitive customs and laws is that of a tree which falls upon a man, or from which it falls and is killed. We can conceive with comparative easy, comparative ease, how the tree might have been put on the same footing with animals. It certainly was treated like them, and was delivered to the relatives and chopped to pieces for the gratification. Of a real or simulated passion. In the Anthony process, there is also no doubt to be traced a different sort. Expiation is expiation is one of the ends most insisted on by Plato, and appeared to have been the purpose of the procedure mentioned by. Achenes, some passages in the Roman historians, which will be mentioned again, again seem to point in the same direction. Another particularity to be noticed is the liability seems to have been regarded as attached to the body doing the damage, in an almost physical sense. Untrained intelligence only imperfectly performs analysis by which jurists. Carry responsibility back to the beginning of a chain of causation. The hatred for anything giving us pain, which wreaks itself on the manifest cause, and which leads even civilized man to kick a door when he pitches his finger, is embodied in the noxio, de de dido, and other kind, other kindred doctrines of. Early Roman law. There is a 
defective passes in GIOS, which seem to say that a liability may sometimes be escaped by giving up even the dead body of the offender. So Levi relates that uh, Bruce Law's Papins have caused a breach of full truce with the Romans, and some knights determined to surrender him. And then, upon his avoiding disgrace and punishment by suicide, they sent his life in his body. It is noticeable that the surrender seemed to be regarded as natural expiation for the breach of the treaty, and that is in equally a matter of course to send the body when the wrongdoer has perished. The most curious example of this sort occur in the region of what we should now call contract. Levi again furnishes the example if indeed the last is not one, the Roman consul Postumius concluded the disgraceful peace of the Gardin Forks per Spondesinium. As Levi said, denying the common story that it was poor Fidas, and it was sent to Rome to obtain the sanction of the people. When there, however, he proposed that uh, the persons who had made the contract made himself should be given up in satisfaction of it, for he said the Roman people, not having sanctioned the agreement, was the so ignorant of the just. Fetalium does not know that they are released from obligation by surrendering us. The formula for surrender seemed to bring the case within the noxio deditio. Cicero narrates a similar surrender for、uh, Marcinius by the Panta Pantridas to the Numeritanes. Who, however, like the Samnites in the former case, refused to receive him. It might be asked what analogy could have been found between a breach of a contract and those wrongs which excite the desire for revenge. It must be remembered that the distinction between tort and breaches of contract, especially between the remedies for the two, is not found readily made. It, con- it is conceivable that a procedure adapted to redress for violence was extended to other cases and ro- arose. Slaves were surrendered for theft as well as for assault. Assault. It is said that a, a debtor who did not pay his debt, or the seller who failed to deliver an article for which he had been paid, were dealt with on the same footing as a thief. This line of thought, together with the quasi material concept of legal obligations, are binding the offending body, which has been noticed when Pambers explained the well-known law of the Twelve Tables as to insolvent,、uh, insolvent debtors. According to that law, if a man was indebted to several creditors and insolvent. Insolvent after a certain form, formalities, formalari- formal- formalities. Sorry, formalities. He might have cut up his body, divided among them. If there was a single creditor, creditor, he might have put his debtor to death or sell him as a slave. If no other right were given but to reduce the debtor to slavery, the law might have taken to taking to look only for to compensation and to be. Uh, modeled on the natural working of the self-redress, the principle of our own law that taking a man's body on execution satisfies the debt, although is not detained, and never seem to be explained in that way. But the right to put to death looks like vengeance, and the, the division of the body shows that the debt was conceived were literally to inhere, in or bind the body with.、Uh, Or when Colum Juris, whatever may be the true explanation of surrender in connection with contracts, 
For the present purpose, we need not go further than the common case of noxio detitio forums. Neither is the seeming adhesion of liability to the very body which did the harm of the first importance. The Roman law dealt merely with the living creatures, which animals, the slaves, if a man was run over. He did not surrender the wagon which crossed him, but the ox which draw the wagon. In this stage, the notion is easy to understand. The desire for vengeance may be felt as strongly against the slave as against the free man, and not without example nowadays that a like pension should be felt against the animal. The surrender of the slave, or the beast, empowered. The injured party drew his will upon them. Payment by the owner was merely a privilege in case he wanted to buy the vengeance off. It will readily be imagined that such a thing has been described could not last when civilization had once to an inconsiderable height. What had been the privilege of buying off vengeance by agreement of paying the damage instead of surrendering the body of the offender? No doubt became a general custom. The Quilling Law passed about a couple of centuries later than the date of the Twelve Tablet、uh, Tables, enlarged the sphere of compensation for bodily injuries. Interpretation enlarged the Quilling Law. Master became personally liable for certain wrongs committed by their slaves with their knowledge. Where. Firstly, they were only bound to surrender the slave. If a, a pack mule threw off its burden upon a passerby because it had been improperly overloaded, or a dog, which might have been restrained, escaped from the master and bite anyone, the old noxious action, as it were called, gave way to action under the new law to enforce general personal liability. Still later, shipowners and innkeepers were made liable as, as if they were wrongdoers for wrongs committed by those in their employ on board ship or in the tavern, although of course committed without the knowledge. The true reason for this exceptional responsibility was exceptional confidence, which was necessary repose in carriers and innkeepers. The sum of the jurists who regarded the surrender of children and the slaves as a privilege intended to limit liability explained this new liability upon, on the ground that the innkeeper or ship owner was to a certain degree guilty of negligence in having employed the services of bad men. This was the first instance of a master being made. Unconditionally liable for the wrongs of his servant, the reason given for it was of a general application, and the principle extended to the scope of the reason. The law as to ship owners, innkeeper, introduced another and more startling innovation. It made them responsible when those whom they employed were free, as well as when they were slaves. For the first time, one man was made. Answerable for the wrongs of another, was always answerable himself, and who had understanding before the law. This was a great change from the bare permission to ransom one's slave as a privilege. But here we have the history of the whole modern doctrine of master and the slave in the principal and the agent. All servants now, as free, as liable to a suit and their masters. Yet the principle introduced on special grounds in a special case when servants were slaves is now the general law of this country and England, and under under it, men daily have to pay large sums for other people's acts in which they have no part and for which they have no sense to blame. But to this day. The reason offered by the Roman jurists for exceptional rule is made to justify this un universal and unlimited responsibility. So much for once of the parents of our common law. Now let's turn for a moment 
to the Teutonic side. The Salic law embodied the uses which all pos- probabilities are of too early a, de- a date, uh, too early a date to have been inferenced either by Rome or the Old Testament. The thirty-sixth chapter of the ancient text provided that if a man is killed by a domestic animal, the owner of the animal shall pay half the compensation, which he would have had to pay to buy off the blood field had he killed the man himself, and for the other half giving up the beast to the complainant. So by chapter 35, if a slave killed a freeman, he was to be surrendered for one half of the compensation to the relatives of the slave man, and the master was to pay the other half. But according to the gloss, the slave or his master has been maltreated by the slave man or his relatives. The master had only to surrender the slave. It's interesting to notice that those more northern sources, which well done, takes to represent a more primitive stage of German law confined liability for animals to surrender alone. There's also a trace of the master to have been able to free himself in some cases at a later date by showing that he, the slave was no longer in his possession. So later provisions making a master liable for the wrongs committed by his slave by his command. In the laws adapted by the Thuringians from the earlier sources, it is provided in terms that the master is to pay for all damage done by his slaves. In short, so far as I am able to trace the order of de- development in the cause of the German tribes, it seems to have been entirely similar to that which we have already following the growth of Roman law, the early liability for slaves and animals were mainly confined to surrender the latter, the became personal as at Rome. The reader may begin to ask for the proof that all this had any bearing on our laws today. So far as concerns inference of the Roman law upon our own, especially the Roman law for masters and servants. The evidence of it is to be found in every book which has been written for the last five hundred years. It has been stated already that we still repeat the reasoning of the Roman lawyers, empty, empty as it is to the present day, it will be seen directly whether the German folk laws can also be followed into England. In the Kentish laws of uh, uh, Horing and uh, Yedre, AD 680, it is said, If anyone slay, slay a freeman, whoever it be, let the owner pay with a hundred shillings, give a pound the slayer. There are several other similar provisions in the nearly contemporary laws of Aini. The surrender to payment are simple alternatives. If a, a waxen slave slain an Englishman, then he who owns him deliver him up, up to the Lord and the kindred, who give six, sixty shilling, shilling, shillings. For his life. Alfred Law had a like provision as to cattle. If a neat wound man, let the neat be delivered up a compounded for. And Alfred, also two hundred years later than the first English lawgivers who had been quoted, seem to have gone back to more primitive notions than we found before his time. For the same principle is extended to the case of a tree by which a man is killed. The end of common work, one man slay another unwillfully, 
let the tree be given to the kindred, and let them head it off the headland within thirty nights, or let him take possession of it for own the wood. It's not in a posit to compare what Mr. Teller had mentioned concerning the rude cookies of、uh, Southern Asia. If the tiger killed a cookie, his family were in disgrace till they had retaliated by killing and eating this tiger or another. But further, if a man is killed by a fallen A fall from a tree is where、well, it would take their revenge by cutting the tree down and scaring it in chips. To return to the English, the later laws, from about a hundred years after Alfred down to the collection of known as the Law of Henry the First, compiled long after the conquest, increased the lord's liability for his household and make him. Thirty for his man's good conduct, though they incur a fine to the king, and the runaway, the lord has to pay it unless he can clear himself of complicity. But I cannot say that I found until a later period the unlimited liability of the master for certain which was worked out on the continent both by the German tribes and and Rome. Whether the principle were established was an in, indigenous growth, or whether the last step was a taking under the influence of the Roman law, of which Bracton made great use, I cannot say. It's enough that the soil was ready for it, and then it took root, and the early day is all that need to be said. Here, with regard to the liability for a master, for the misdeeds of his servants, to be continued. It's negatively shown that what became of the principle is applied to animals. Nowadays, a man bound at his peril to keep a cantle from transpassing. And is liable for damage done by his dog or by any fierce animal. If he has notice of a tendency in the brood to be to do the harm complained of, the question is whether any connection can be established between these very sensible and intelligible rules for modern law, as a surrender directed by King Alfred. Let us turn to one of the old books of the Scotch law, where the old principle still appears in full force and is stated with its reasons, with its reasons and then understood. <clears throat> Gift and wild, a headstrong horse carried and men against his will over a crag or hodge or to the water, or the man happening to join the horse shall pretend to the king as. Is cheat, but it is otherwise for any tame and、uh, danton the horse. If any man foolishly rise and be sharp spurned to compel his horse to take the water, and the man drowns, the horse shall shall not should not be is cheat. For then comes be the man's fault, and transpass not of the horse, and the man has received his punishment. In so far as he is perished and dead, and the horse, quite a deed non fault, shall not be escaped. The like reasons of all other beasts, quick slays any man, and it it and in later work of the quick slander they have a guilt. For all these beasts sh- should be escaped. The forbidden manner for barren course continues to follow. It is to wait. But this question is asked in the law: If a lord has an animal, a male, or any man fall in the dam, and be borne down with the water, quails he comes to the quail, and、uh, there be slain to death with the quail. Quither all the male 
uh, mailing to be issued or not. The law says there to nay and be this reason for it is a and dead thing and dead thing may not do felony nor be made issued through their guilt. Though their guilt swathe the male in this case is not culpable and in the law it is lawful to the lord of the land to hew any meaning on his uh, and drink water could is best like him likes him. The reader will see in this passage, as it has been remarked already for the Roman law, then the distinction is taken between things which are capable of good and those which are not, between living and the dead things. But he will also see that no difficulty was felt in treating animals as guilty. Taken as an early passage of the English law, report what was laid down by one of the English judges in 1333. It was stated for law that if if my dog kills your sheep and I freshly after the fact tender you the dog and you are without recovery against me. More than three centuries later, in 1776, it was said by Twinston Jr. that uh, if one has kept a tame fox, which goes loose, gets loose, and grew wild, a uh, grows wild. He then has kept him before shall not answer for the damage the fox does after he has lost him, and he has resumed his wild nature. It is doubtful whether then the sentence ever could have been written, but for the lingering inference of the notion that the ground of the owner's liability was his ownership of the offending thing, that it, thing and his failure to surrender it. When the fox escaped by another principal law, the ownership was at an end. In fact, then where consideration was seriously pressed in England, as late as 1846, with regard to the monkey, to the monkey which escaped and bit the plaintiff, so it seemed to be a reasonable conjecture that it was this will of thinking which led Lord Holt, near the beginning of the last century, to intimate that one ground on which a man is bound that is a peril to restrain cattle from trespassing that he has valuable property in such animals, whereas he has no other dogs, for which his responsibility is less. To this day, in fact, the cautious judges state the law as to cattle to be, that if I am the owner of animal, in which by the law the right of the property can exist, I am bound to take care that it does not stray into the land of my owner, among my neighbor. I do not mean that our modern law on this subject is only a survival, and that the only change from primitive notions or to substitute the owner for the offending animal, for though it is probable that the early law was one of the causes which led to the modern doctrine, there has been too much good sense in every state of a law to adopt any such sweeping consequences as would follow from the wholesome, wholesale transfer for liability supposed. Owner is not bound that his peril to keep his cattle from harming his neighbor's person. In in some of the earliest instances of personal liability, even for transplants on the neighbor's land, the ground seemed to have been the owner's negligence. It's the nature of those animals which the common law recognizes as a subject of ownership to stray, and when straying, to do damage by trampling them and eating crops. At the same time, it is usual and easy to restrain them. On the other hand, the dog, which is not subject to property, does no harm by simply crossing the land of others than its owner. And to this extent, the new law might have followed the old. The right of property in the offending animal, which was the ancient ground of responsibility, might have been adopted safely enough as a test of liability based on the fault of the owner. But the responsibility for damage the kind not to be expected from such animals it determined on grounds of policy comparatively little disturbed by tradition. The development of a personal liability for fierce wild animals in Rome has been explained. Our law seemed to have followed the Roman. We we'll now follow the history of that branch as a primitive notion which was the least likely to survive the liability of inanimate things.
It will be remembered that the King Halfred obtained the surrender for tree, but that is a land of Scotch law, refused it because the dead thing could not have it killed. It will be remembered also that the animals which the Scotch law forfeited were exchanged to the king. The same thing has remained true in England until well into this century, with regard even to animate objects, as long as, as long ago as Bracton. In case a man was slain, the coroner was to value the object causing the death, and that was to be forfeited. San Diondand per regi, it was to be given to God, that is to say, to the church for the king, to be expended for the good of his soul. A man's death has ceased to be the primary affair of his friends, as in the time of the barbarian folk laws, the king. Who furnished the court now sues for the penalty. He supplanted the family in the claim on the guilty thing, and the church supplanted him. In Edward the first time, some of the cases remind remind of the barbarian laws and the rudest stage. If a man fell from a tree, the tree was dilmaned. Dil If the drawn in the well, the well was to be filled up. Did not mean that it did not matter that the forfeited instrument belonged to an innocent person. When a man killed another with the sword of John and the steel, the sword shall be forfeited as dilmaned, and yet no fault, you no know, default, is in the owner. That is from a book written in the reign of Henry the Eighth, about fifteen thirty, and it has been repeated from Queen Elizabeth's time to. Within one hundred years, that if my horse strikes a man, and afterwards I sell my horse, and after that the man dies, the horse shall be forfeited. Hence it is that in all indictments for homicide, until very lately it has been necessary to state the instrument causing the death and its value, and that the stroke was given by a certain penknife, penknife, value sixpence. Uh, so as to secure the forfeiture, he said that a steam engine has been forfeited in this way. Now come to what I regarded as the most remarkable transformation of this principle, one which is a most important factor in our law as it is today. I must for the moment leave the common law and take up the doctrines of the animality. In the early books, which has us to be referred to. And、long afterwards, the fact of notion is adverted to as of much importance. Maxim of Henry Spengno, a judge in the time Edward the First, is reported that where a man is killed by a cart or by the fall of a horse, or in other like manner, and the thing in motion is the cause of the death, it shall be dumbdamned. So it was said in the next ring that only load could am over. Come e cord oscidit hominiens diodadem domino regi erit well fiado clarisi. The reader sees how motion gives light to the object forfeited. The most striking example of this sort is a ship. And accordingly, the old books say that if a man falls from the ship and is drowned, the motion of the ship must be taken to. The Caused the death and the ship is forfeited, provided, however, that it is happening in fresh water. For if the death took place on the high seas, that was outside the ordinary jurisdiction, the proviso has been supposed to mean that the ship and the sea were not forfeited. But there is a long series of petitions to the king in Parliament that such forfeitures. May be done away with, which tells a different story. The truth seems to be that the forfeiture took place, but in a different court. A manuscript of the reign of Henry the Sixth, the Sixth, only、uh, recently printed, discloses the fact that if a man was killed or drowned at the sea by the motion of the sea, the ship, the vessel was forfeited to the admiral upon a proceeding. In the admiral's court, and subject to release by favor of the admiral or the king, the ship is the most living of inanimate things. Servants sometimes see she of a clock, but every one gives a gender to vessels.
and we need not to be surprised, therefore, to find a mode of dealing which has shown such extraordinary vitality in the criminal law, apply with even more striking thoroughness in the admiralty. It is only by supposing the ship to have been treated as if endowed with a personality that the arbitrary same seeming particularity of the maritime law can be made intelligible. And on that supposition, they at once become consistent and logical. But we'll have seen what those peculiarities are. Take first the case of a collision, let's say. A collision takes place between two vessels, the Ticanderoga and the Malampos, through the fault of the Ticanderoga alone. That ship is under a lease at the time the lessee has his own master in charge and the owner of the vessel has no manner of control over it. The owner, therefore, is not to blame. And he can even be charged on the ground that the damage was done by his servants. He's free from personal liability or elementary principles. It is perfectly settled that there is a lien on the vessel for the amount of the damage done. And this means that the vessel may be arrested or sold to pay the loss in any admiralty court whose process will reach her. If a labor stable keeper Let's horse in the wagon to a customer who runs a man down by careless driving. No one would think of claiming a right to seize the horse and the wagon. It would be seen that the only property which could be sold to pay for the wrong, for the wrong was the property of the wrongdoer. But again, suppose that the vessel, instead of being on the lease, is in charge of a pilot whose employment is made compulsory by the laws of the port which she is thus entering the Supreme Court of the United States, hold the ship liable in this instance. Also, the English courts would probably have decided otherwise, and the matter is settled in England by legislation. But there is a court of appeal. The Privy Council has been largely composed of common law lawyers, and has shown a marked tendency to assimilate common law doctrine. And a common law, one who could not impose a personal liability on the owner, could only bind the particular cantor to answer for the wrong of which it had been the instrument. But our Supreme Court long recognized that a person may bind the shape when he could not bind the owners personally because he was not the agent. It may be admitted that if this doctrine were not supported by an appearance of good sense, it would not have survived. The ship is the only security available in dealing with the foreigners, rather than since one's own citizen to search for a remedy abroad in strange courts, it is easy to seize the vessel and satisfy the claimed home, leaving the foreign owners to get their in- indemnity and may be able, I dare see some such sort and help to keep the practice alive, but the practice alive. But I believe the true historical foundation is elsewhere. The ship, no doubt, like a sword, would have been forfeited or causing death in whatsoever hands it might have been. So if the master is a mariner of a ship furnished with letters for reprisal, committed a privacy against a friend of the king, the owner lost his ship by the admiralty, admiralty law, although the crime, the crime was committed without his knowledge or assent. It seems most likely that the principle by which the ship was forfeited to the king for causing death or for privacy for, of, for piracy was the same as that by which it was bound to private sufferers for other damage, in whose hands soever it might have been when it did harm. If we should say to an uneducated man today, she did it and she ought to pay for it, it may be doubted whether he would see the fallacy or be ready to explain that she was the only property and that the see the ship has no as to pay for it, was simply a dramatic will of a saying that somebody's property was to be sold and the proceeds applied to pay for the wrong committed by somebody else. It would seem that a similar form of words has been enough to satisfy the minds of Greek lawyers. The following is a passage from a judgment by Chief Justice Marshall, which 
is quoted with approval by just about Judge Story in giving the opinion for the Supreme Court of the United States. This is not a proceeding against the owner. It is a proceeding against the vessel for the offense committed by the vessel, which is nonetheless an offense. It does the less subject to her to forfeiture because it was committed without the authority and against the will of the owner. It's true that an inanimate matter can commit no offense, but this body is animated and put in action by the crew, who are guided by the master. The vessel acts and speaks by the master. She reports herself by the master. It is therefore not unreasonable that the vessel should be affected by this report. And again, just a story quotes from another case. The things here primarily considered as the offender, or rather the offense is primarily attached to the thing. In other words, those great judges are so of course aware that a ship is no more alive than a male will, so that not only the law did in fact deal with it as if it were a lie, but that it was reasonable that the law should do so. The reader will observe that they do not say simply that it is reasonable on ground for policy to sacrifice justice for, to the owner, to security, for somebody else, but that it is reasonable to deal with the vessel as an offending thing. Whatever the hidden ground the policy may be, their thought still close itself in personifying language. Let's now go on and follow the peculiarities of the maritime law in other directions, for the cases which have been stated are only parts of a larger whole. By the maritime law of the Middle Ages, the ship was not only the source, but the limit of liability. The rule already prevailed, which has been borrowed and adopted by the English standards and by our own Act of Congress of 1851, according to which the owner is discharged from a responsibility for wrongful acts of a master, appointed him by himself upon surrendering his interest in the vessel and the freight which she had earned. By the doctrines of her agency, he would be personally liable for the whole damage, if the origin of the system of limited liability to which is believed to be so essential to modern commerce is to be attributed to those considerations of public policy on which it would now be sustained. That system has nothing to do with the law of a collision. But if the limited liability here stands on the same ground that is a noxium, de, uh, de detail confirms explanation already given of the liability of the shape for wrongs done by its violate while out of the owner's hands, and conversely, existence of that liability confirms the argument here. Let's now take another rule for, for, for which, as usual, there is a plausible explanation policy. Fried, it is said, the mother of wages, for we are told if the ship perished, if the mariners were to have the wages in such cases, it would not use their endeavors nor hazard their lives for the safety of the ship. The best commentary on this reasoning is that the law has recently been changed by a statute. But even by the old law, there was an exception inconsistent with the supposed reason. In case of a shipwreck, there was the usual, use of a, usual case of a failure to learn fright as long as any portion of the ship was saved. The link of the mariners remained. I suppose would have been said, but it was a sound policy to encourage them to save all they could. If we consider that the sailors were regarded as employed by the ship, we shall understand very readily both the rule and the exception. The ship is a data, as was said in arguing a case decided in the time of William the Third. If the debtor perished, there was an end of the matter. If the pa the part came ashore, then might be proceeded against. If the rule in its modern form, then Friday is the mother of wages, is shown by the explanation commonly given to have reference to the question whether the ship is a lost or a right thief. In the most ancient source of the maritime law, now extant, which uh, has anything about the matter so far as I am able to discover, that the statement is that the mariners will lose their wages when the ship is lost.
In like manner, in what is said by the English editor, Sir Travers Twiss, to be the oldest part, the consulate of the sea, we read that、uh, whatever the freighter may be who runs away or dies, the ship is bound to pay the mariners. I think we may assume that the vessel was bound by the contract with the sailors. Much in the same way as it was by the wrongs for which it was answerable, thus as the debtor's body was answerable for his debts, as well as for his crimes, under the ancient law of Rome. The same thing is true of other maritime dealings with the vessel, whether by will of a contract or otherwise. If salvage services rendered to a vessel, the Admiralty Court will hold the vessel, although it has been doubted whether an action contract will ally. If the owners were sued the law, so the ship is bound by the master contract to carry cargo. This as in case of a collision, although she was on the lease at the time. In such cases, also according to our Supreme Court, the master may bind the vessel. We can bind the general owners by custom. The ship is bound to the merchandise, and the merchandise to the ship. By the maritime law. Every contract the master implies an hypothecation. It, it might be argued, no doubt, with the force that so far the user of maritime contract are concerned. The dealing must be on the security, the shape of merchandise in many cases, and therefore, it is policy to give the security in all cases. That is the risk to which it is subject to ship owners is calculable, and that they must take it into account when they lead their vessels. Again, in many cases, when a party asserts maritime lien by way of a contract, he has improved the condition of the thing upon which the lien is claimed, and the, this has been recognized as a ground for it, for such a lien in some systems. But this is not true universally. Nor is it the most important cases. It must be left to the reader to decide whether ground has not been shown for believing that the same. Metaphysical confusion, which naturally arose, and the ship's wrongful acts affected by the the will of thinking as to his, her contracts, the whole manner of dealing with vessels obviously took the form which prevailed in the eases first mentioned. Badesius, a high authority, says that lien for the freight prevails even against the owner Stolongos, and the master deals less with the person than the thing. So it was said in the argument of a famous English case that the ship is instead of the owner, and therefore is answerable. In many cases, a contract as well as so as tort, the vessel was not only the security for the debt, but the limit of the owner's li uh, owner's liability. The principle of the animality are embodied in the, in the form of a procedure. A suit might be brought there against the vessel by name. Any person interested in it. Being at liberty to come in and defend, but the suit, if successful, and in the seller for the vessel, and the payment of the plaintiff's claim after the proceeds, as a, as long ago as the time of James I, it was said that the libel ought to be only against the ship, the goods, and not against the party. That authority for the statements was cited from the reign of Henry the Sixth, the same reign when. As we have seen, the animal claimed the forfeiture of ships for causing death. I'm bound to say, however, that I can't find such authority of that date. We、we'll、now follow the development of the chief forms of liability in modern law for anything other than the immediate and manifest consequences of man's own act. We've seen the parallel course of events in the two parents, the Roman law and the German customs, and in the offer. Offspring of these two are English soil with regard to servants, animals, and inanimate things. We're seeing a single germ multiplying and branching into products, products and different from each other, and the flower from the root. It hardly remains to be asked to ask what that germ was. We have seen that it was desire. Of retaliation against the offending thing itself, undoubtedly it might be argued that many of the rules stated were derived from a seizure of the offending thing as a security for reparation 
the first members outside the law. That explanation, as well as one offered here, would show that modern views of responsibility had not yet been attained. As the owner of the thing, you might very well not have been the person in fault. But uh, such as not has not been the will of those most competent to judge. A consideration of the earliest instances will show, as might have been expected, that vengeance, not compensation, that vengeance on the offending thing, were the original object. The ox in Exodus was to be stoned. The axe in the Athenian law was to be banished. The tree in Mr. Teller's instance was to be chopped to pieces. The slave under all the system was to be surrendered to the relative of the slain man, that they might do with him what they like. The dodem was a, a cursed thing. The original limitation liability to surrender when the owner was before the court could not be accounted for if it was his liability, not that of his property which was in question. Even whereas in some of the cases, expiation seemed to be intended rather than vengeance, the object equally remote from an actual judicial, judicial distress. The foregoing history, apart from the purpose for which it had been given, war in literature is a paradox of form and substance in the development of law. In form, it grows. Its growth is logical. The official theory is that each decision follows its um, psychologic, psychologically from existing precedents, but as the clavicle in the can only tells the existence of some earlier creature to which a column was useful, precedents arrive in the law long after the use they once served as at the end and the reason for them has been forgotten. The result of following them, following them must have often been failure and confusion from the mere logical point of view. On the other hand, in substance, the growth of the law is uh, legislative. And this is in deeper sense than that uh, what the court declared have always been the law is in fact new. It's a legislative in its grounds. The word considerations which judges most rarely mention and always with apology are the secret roads from which the law draws all the juices of life. I mean, of course, consideration for what is expedient for the community concerned. Every important principle which is developed by litigation is, in fact, at the bottom, the result of a more or less definitely understood views of a public policy. More generally, to be sure, under our practice and traditions, the unconscious result of instinctive preferences and inarticulated convictions. But nonetheless, traceable to be used of public policy in the last analysis, and as the law is administered by able and experienced men who know too much to sacrifice good sense to a syllogism, it will be found that when ancient rules maintain themselves in the way that has been and will be shown in this book, new reasons, more fitted to the time, have been found for them, and that uh, they gradually recede a new content at least a new form from the grounds to which they are being transplanted. But here the though this process is being largely unconscious, it is important on that account to bring to mind what the actual course of events has been. If it were only to insist on a more conscious recognition of the legislative function of the courts, as I explained, it would be useful as we should we shall see more clearly for the arm. Well, it being said, we'll explain the failure for all theories which consider the law only from its formal side, whether they attempted to deduce the cops from a, a prior postulate or fall into the humble error for supposing the science of the law to reside in the ele ele elegantia juris or logical co cohesion of a part with a part. The truth is that the law always approaching or never reaching consistency. It is forever adopting new principles from life to one end, always retaining old ones from history and the other, which are not yet been absorbed or sloughed off. It will become entirely consistent only when it is ceased to grow. The study upon which we have been engaged is necessary both for the knowledge and for the revision of the law. However much we
may qualify the law into a series with seemingly self-sufficient propositions. Those propositions will be but a, a phase in continuous growth, in a continuous growth. To understand the scope fully, to know how they will be dealt with by judges trained in the past, which the law embodies, we must ourselves know something of the past. The history of what the law has been is necessary to the knowledge of what the law is. Again, the process which I have described has involved in the attempt of following precedents as well as to give a good reason for them. We found that in large, important branches of the law, the various grounds of policy on which the various rules has been justified, are later inventions to account for what are in fact survivals from the more printing times. We have right to consider the popular reasons and taking a broad view of the field to decide anew whether those reasons are satisfactory. There may be, notwithstanding, the manner of their appearance, if the truth were not often succeeded by error, if old implements could not be adjusted, adjusted to new uses, human progress would be slow. But scrutiny and revision are justified. But none of the foregoing considerations, nor the purposes of showing the materials for anthropology contained in the history of the law, are the immediate object here. My aim and purpose have been to show that the various forms of liability known to modern law spring from the common ground for revenge. In the sphere of contract, the fact, the fact will hardly be material outside the cases which have been stated in this lecture. But in the criminal law, the law of torts, it is of the first importance. It shows that we have started from a moral basis, from the thought that someone was to blame. It remains to prove that while the terminology of morals is still retained, and while the law does still and always, in a certain sense, measure legal liability by moral standards, it nevertheless, by the word necessity of the nature, is continually transmuting those moral standards into external or objective ones from which the actual guilt of the party concerned is wholly eliminated.